Okay, everyone, we'll press on as we have just a, a brief window to discuss a little bit Iraq's role in the region and the issue of Iraq's foreign policy. I'm Jane Kinnanmont, Senior Research Fellow on the Middle East and North Africa <coughs> programme at Chatham House. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Professor Gareth Stansfield, uh, who many of you will know from previous events and discussions here at Chatham House, a professor at Exeter University and for a long time an associate fellow with us. He recently moved on to our near neighbours, the Royal United Services Institute, but we're working together on a number of issues relating to Iraq, most notably on a one-year research project which is seeking to shed more light on Iraq's foreign policy. And this is trying to take a slightly different approach to many of the projects on Iraq's international relations, which have focused largely more on other countries' policies towards Iraq. So I might begin by, by asking you, Gareth, why uh, you first devised this concept for a research project and, and why it's important. Okay, uh, thank you, Jane, and it's, uh, it's great to be here in a very familiar hall. Um, I think we had um, three points, of, uh, three starting points of this. The first was considering whether Iraq was uh, a subject or an object mm -hmm. of, of international relations, and, and by that I mean whether it was being used as an object in the national interests of others, and Iraq was merely the stage, the theatre on which the interests of Iran and Turkey and other places would be performed, or whether it had begun to generate or had the capacity to generate agency within the regional setting that it would become a subject uh, going forward. Um, and so we, we were asking that question amongst us, and to tell you the truth, we really didn't have the answer, so that seemed to be a good starting point for a research project. The second area was um, my own work on Kurdistan in particular. Uh, Kurdistan region had emerged very clearly as, in some ways, a, uh, very clearly a de facto state, but one that had um, agency on the international setting. I think it's fair to say that Kurdistan is not going away. Uh, the map of the Middle East is being drawn to include a Kurdistan region in it, whether it's part of Iraq or not. And so to look at how an independent Kurdistan foreign policy was working um, alongside, against, antagonistically, um, with an Iraqi foreign policy was a, presented very interesting questions. And I think antagonistically is, a, is an interesting point to focus on uh, later. The third point was work of Charles Tripp, who had previously written about foreign policy under Saddam and talked about the existence of a singular presidential palace, uh, Saddam's presidential palace, of course, and foreign affairs basically started not at the boundary of Iraq, but at the boundary of the presidential palace. Everybody was a foreigner unless you were with Saddam. And um, we applied some of those ideas about, well, does that still hold, do those tendencies, structures still hold in Iraq today? And we got to the point that you could actually complicate this significantly and suggest that there were perhaps certainly not one presidential palace, but many. Uh, and Iraqi foreign policy, if we could call it that, uh, was constructed around a whole different set of domestic actors. Um, First from that, we get into areas of understanding the interrelationships of the domestic uh, environment of Iraq and its, relation, its impact upon how foreign policy is constructed. But I, th I think we got to a very interesting point, certainly in the session that we held in Washington, that we realized that talking about foreign policy was perhaps a bit of a misnomer. Um, Iraq doesn't have foreign policy. Uh, Iraq has foreign relations. And we started particularly with Ambassador Estrabadi, if he's still here, to play around with that sort of concept. I have to say that that idea and, and that writing didn't go down at all well with Foreign Minister Hoshi Zibari, who, is a very, uh, who, who very strongly articulates a vision of Iraqi foreign policy. But um, that's a discussion that, that we'd like to take forward with him in the future. Absolutely. Well, this time last week, I was sitting in the American University of Suleimania, also presenting some of the preliminary findings of this research with His Excellency Minister Zabari sitting in the front row. So I'm afraid I feel much less daunted uh, by talking to, to all of you about it. But I think that um, we have encountered some very different perceptions of Iraq's foreign policy during the research that we've done to date. And it's the research has consisted of various components. Our team has made field visits to Baghdad, Erbil, and Suleimania, and has conducted interviews there, but has also convened workshops in Washington and in London. And as with so much in Iraq, we encounter very different perceptions and very different narratives uh, depending you know, where, where we are and who we're talking to. 
I think it's very clear that, you know, historically, uh, Iraq has been an incredibly important foreign policy actor in the region and an actor that uh, under the previous regime was seen by several of its neighbors as uh, an aggressive threat, one that was involved in three interstate wars in the past three decades, something very unusual in the modern age. And so several of Iraq's neighbors have had an interest in, in seeing a future Iraq that, that doesn't have that same kind of foreign policy. Uh, in contrast, in the, the time since 2003, it has often been Iraq's domestic changes rather than a, a clearly articulated or institutionalized or deliberate foreign policy uh, that, have, that has had the biggest impact on the, the neighborhood. So uh, for other countries in the region, they've seen concerns about the internal changes in Iraq, the shift towards an elected government, the change in the, the distribution of the balance of power uh, the rising role of the Kurds, and so on. Uh, but the, the issues of concern to them haven't necessarily been issues of deliberate Iraqi policy. I think it's also worth mentioning that sort of from the point of view of uh, the foreign ministry and our interlocutors there, um, they would argue that there have been a number of successes, that the, the primary uh, objectives of Iraq's foreign policy post 2003 was to normalize the state's position in the international community and they focused particularly uh, in getting out from the many restraints that was that were put on them on, by the UN under chapter 7 and secondly on negotiating the peaceful end to foreign occupation uh, and as regards those uh, notable progress has been made uh, but it's often the case that Internationally, more attention is paid to Iraq's policies towards the neighboring states, and those tend to be the most divisive. Um, it's perhaps Syria, above all, that has refocused Western attention on Iraq's foreign policy. And Gareth, I wondered if you might comment on where you see the most contentious areas that Iraqi policymakers have to deal with in their foreign relations. I think it's a question about who the Iraqi foreign policy makers are as well, and, and we had a, a long discussion about actors. Um, interestingly, we, we, when we started talking about um, Iraq's relationship with Gulf states, um, we hit quite a, a bit of a vacuum, I think, that the, there's a notion that Iraq would be important uh, coming back, back into Gulf politics, perhaps constructively so, but still a great deal of fear um, going back to the, the 1980s and the, a, a view that Iraq somehow is deterministically positioned to be uh, an aggressive Gulf player rather than a, a constructive one. Um, however, it was telling that the, 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 the analysis around Iraq's involvement in the Gulf was very much more anecdotal, anecdotal and fear-based rather than mm. any particular view about, uh, based upon uh, 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 any sense of objectivity. Um, within Washington, I think we found it interesting that we actually struggled to generate a debate with um, members of the US administration. Mm. Iraq very much wasn't on the radar, and it was almost, uh, to use, a, 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 I suppose, a Turkish foreign policy phrase, it was a zero sums, uh, a zero problems approach. So Iraq is not a problem, we're not going to recognize it if it's a problem, um, and, um, and, and that's how it will be. Um, I think that's perhaps a little bit short-sighted. Um, our engagement in London was much more effective. Um, I think just in terms of actors, it was very interesting. We had the good fortune to meet with many members of the Iraqi parliament, many members of the Iraqi government. Um, and again, under the Chatham House rule, we're not going to say who they were. Um, but it was rather concerning how quickly discussions would degenerate away from a view of Iraq as a unified actor to a view of different communal groups expressing their views about what should happen mm. going forward. Um, there wasn't a cohesive sense of, of a, a vision of Iraq. Uh, and if you don't have the vision of where you're going, then it's pointless talking about a strategy of how to get there, let alone a policy. Um, I think looking at, to, to answer your question, where, where the key areas of concern were, clearly Syria was a, a major, major issue uh, and increasingly being seen in a zero-sum sort of way. And it's a focus that we've been addressing quite a lot uh, within Chatham House. Um, 
and it's a, it's a very interesting example of how there are perhaps two diametrically opposed foreign policies being pursued within one state. With the policy of Maliki, if we can, if we can call it a policy, a policy, I think it's more of a, a, a passive acceptance of things that are going on, um, of one of being not opposing what's happening in Syria, but perhaps allowing support to be shown to the, the Assad regime. Uh, whereas the, uh, the, the position of Erbil and the Kurdistan regional government is quite different, where we, where we are seeing uh, far more active support for components, certain components of uh, the Kurdish opposition that has emerged in Syria as well. But Syria has, certainly has the potential to um, expose the cleavage of Iraqi foreign policy decision making in a way that perhaps other areas don't. Um, of course, there was a lot of focus as well upon the relationship between Turkey and Kurdistan going forward. Um, but I think we, ne we still haven't managed to dismiss the idea that Iraq is an object in international relations and foreign relations. It still seems to be struggling to transform itself away from being, um, uh, being a, a vessel in which other, other regional powers engage in their own struggles. Or, or compete uh, and actually projecting itself on a wider regional setting. And it's going to be interesting following mm -hmm. Iraq over this election year to see if that changes. Absolutely. I think the discussions that we've had of again and again return to domestic politics, and I agreed very much with the point made earlier that to some extent different domestic factions are creating incentives for foreign in in intervention or interference. Uh, because of a sense that the future direction of foreign policy isn't settled and many other actors with a stake in those outcomes are therefore trying to pursue their own interests. Since we have only 15 minutes left of this session, perhaps we can open it up to questions or comments from the floor. Uh, I see a gentleman over here, I think, first put his hand up and then we can uh, come over to, to this side. We'll take, um, take two at a time, I think. Uh, thanks very much. It's Zab Setna from Northern Gulf Partners. Uh, Gareth, you started by saying, um, I'll paraphrase, the map of Kurdistan is established uh, in the world whether it's part of Iraq or not. Uh, so um, I'd like to ask you about that. Is the territorial integrity of Iraq at threat? Uh, and you know, how realistic is the possibility of Kurdish independence? Uh, do you want to take that now, or should we take it? Uh, let's take another question here at the front, and then we'll, we'll come back. Sort of an allied uh, Kurdish-connected sure. question. Um, if uh, a new settlement or a re renewed and enlarged settlement of the Kurdish question in Turkey emerges, mm -hmm. uh, seems certainly possible, perhaps likely, uh, what impact is that going to have on Iraqi Kurdistan? And how will both of those uh, parts of Kurdistan relate under, in that new guise to uh, Syrian Kurdistan? It would be very useful to have Dr. Latif also saying what he thinks about Iraq's integrity and the rise of Kurdistan. Um, I, I, I think the integrity of Iraq is under pressure right now. I'm, I'm not going to sit on the fence with this one. I think there have been developments over the last few years that have brought, that, 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 that have damaged the relationship between Erbil and Baghdad to such a degree that it's now, it, it would now be, um, uh, five years ago it would have been quite ridiculous to have talked about the independence of Kurdistan. Now I think it's quite ridiculous not to have it there as a possibility at least, and I think we should be looking at possible developments that could lead to the secession of Iraq. And incidentally, if we look at the constellation of international developments that are going on around the Kurdistan region in the Middle East right now, there, there are some parallels with how international affairs coalesced around Kosovo and its move towards uh, recognition too. So it's, it, I don't think it is beyond the realms of possibility anymore. And I think the, the further, further that President Barzani and Prime Minister Maliki um, get apart, and uh, I don't think they're terribly close friends right now, to, to put it mildly, then this just feeds into, into what is a very divisive situation. And of course, we have the, the recent passing of the, the Iraqi budget. Uh, the Kurds are out of pocket 
uh, the whole standoff over oil and gas that we've heard so much about today. Um, it, it seems to me that it's, it's an option that must be getting increasingly attractive. And of course, that ties into what is happening in Turkey. Uh, the, the ongoing peace process between the Erdogan government and the PKK that does involve Abdullah Öcalan coming back into the fray, even though he's still on his island prison, but with BDP representatives going to see him, is a sea change in the politics of Turkey. And it looks as though it actually has some traction, not only within the government, but in society at large. And I'd go as far to say that if and when the PKK issue in Turkey is resolved, that actually facilitates the further strengthening of ties between Ankara and Erbil, because that one very um, threatening issue for the Turkish state about Kurdistan has been possibly not removed, but it is then being managed and there is a process in place. Uh, the, the, the alternative to that is that as soon as Turkey gets what it wants with the PKK, then it drops the Iraqi Kurds like a stone and it goes, and goes back to Baghdad. Um, I tend to go with the first scenario rather than the second, as I think there's a lot of mutual interest, uh, self-interest between Ankara and Erbil uh, going forward. With regards to the relations with Syria, I think um, Erbil is engaged in, in Syria at this point um, in a strategy that is there largely to satisfy Ankara as well and to make sure that Ankara does not view developments in uh, possible PKK-related developments in Syria as being something that the KRG in Iraq are supporting and pushing. And um, I wouldn't like to say that the Iraqi Kurdish leadership is, being, uh, uh, is engaging in Syria in, in a sort of pro-Turkish or any other sort of way. I think they have their own interests there too. But there, there is clearly a coalescence of interest going on around this particular leadership in Erbil and the wider Kurdish question in the Middle East. I might add uh, that I think over most of the past decade there's been some tension between some idealistic aspirations of much of the Iraqi Kurdish public for a greater independence based on a strong sense of national identity and a realism of local politicians who know that challenging the regional state system is risky and dangerous. This is now beginning to become more uncertain as the events in Syria cause people to question the, the future boundaries of different states in the Middle East and to think about things in different ways. And unfortunately, that, that coincides with these ongoing tensions between Baghdad and Erbil over the oil law, as was mentioned, and over the status of the Peshmerga. But when it comes to foreign policy, it doesn't seem to me anyway that the, that the interests of the Kurdistan regional government and of the Baghdad government are really so opposed. Uh, and I think while it's notable that there's been great success in developing a strong relationship between uh, the Kurdistan region and Turkey, there's also a lot of business activity, for instance, between Turkish companies and counterparts in Basra, which is often overlooked. So I think when it comes to foreign policy, there's perhaps less of a, a zero-sum game. And also would be interested if Dr. Latif or, uh, would, would be interested in, in sharing a comment. Could, could I just say one last thing to, to Zab's question? Uh, the, the final piece in the jigsaw is an independent oil export capacity, which they don't have right now. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of speculation about whether they will get it sooner than later. I think th that becomes the game changer. There are indications that perhaps something is happening. Who knows? Um, but it's, um, that, that will be the final piece that allows Kurdistan to move in this direction. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well, uh, I think Zab knows the answer himself, but I think he just presented this question. Uh, Professor Gareth is quite familiar with the Kurdish situation and Iraq situation. And still we have the foreign minister of Iraq, Mr. Zabari, who is a member of Kurdistan Democratic Party. And the president of Iraq is still Mr. Talabani. And large number of Kurds are members of parliament in Iraqi parliament, and number of ministers and other high officials in Iraq. I think, to be quite honest, until a year ago, the Kurdish population, majority, I'm not talking about extreme or individuals or some political groups, they were all in favor of a strong Iraq. And uh, we shouldn't forget that the Kurdish political parties and Kurdish politicians were the first to go to Baghdad asking for formation of an Iraqi government. 
rather than separation from Baghdad. But they emphasize on a federal Iraq. And they want a strong federal Iraqi government. While the thinking in Baghdad, by majority of political parties, is still a centralized Iraqi government. This has created a conflict. But at the same time, I think even today, majority of the Kurdish population in Iraqi Kurdistan, they want to be a strong part of Iraq. They want to share uh, budget. They want to share uh, foreign uh, policy. They want to have yeah. the same army. And there are certain differences. Major difference is, again, really establishing or putting forward the oil law, which has created some tension between uh, the central government and KRG. The second point is disputed areas between Iraqi central government and the KRG, Kirkuk, Mosul, number of other places, which is highly populated and is quite a sensitive issue. Third problem is really whether Iraq will continue to have a very strong central government without deregulations of the laws and the customs and other aspects of life, or are they going to implement proper uh, decentralization and uh, federal system for Iraq? I think if these issues are solved, I think majority of Iraqi Kurdish people and Iraqi people want to remain united. I'm not talking about 50 or 100 years from now on, yeah. because most of the Kurds, they believe, and the Iraqis, as you know, they believe. I mean, I can ask a number of people who are Iraqis. They believe self-determination for every nation in the uh, region. And the Kurdish people have that right of self-determination, whether it's a federal Iraq or whether it's independent Kurdistan. But for the time being, I can see most of the Kurdish and majority of the Kurdish people, they want to remain in a strong Iraq, Iraq which is everybody's equal. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. I see lots of hands going up. If you could take them to the gentleman here, just eat in, in front. Yes, please. Thank you. Peter Batchelor from UNDP. And let me also just say how delighted we are to be supporting uh, today's event. Um, two points that you might want to add to in thinking about uh, Iraq's foreign relations. One is a comment made recently by Dr. Al Shukri, the Minister of Planning, where he announced that in the coming years, Iraq is going to become a donor. And in fact, already Iraq has uh, indicated its interest in doing that through support they provided to the um, Electoral Commission in Tunisia with the recent elections there. So that's one. And in fact, the government has now for the second year in a row established a partnership fund in the federal budget that actually allows for cost sharing between international donors and the government on, on joint projects. And the second is a, dis is a point we discussed yesterday, as you know, and that is what potential role could Iraqi play as a more constructive actor, perhaps in the Middle East, going forward, rather than as an object of foreign policy, but more as a uh, kind of constructive agent? Thank you. Thank you. And let's take the gentleman behind you. My name is Muafak Arslan, Iraqi Turkmen. My question from the uh, professor is, uh, the reason of marginalization of Iraqi Turkmen there the third uh, component of Iraq population, and uh, they are distancing them from a uh, major political equation uh, and considering their area, Turkmen Ali, as a disputed area. Is this a reason of uh, Turkish being a big brother of them and uh, where their benefit serve him to uh, defend them, or it is the reason of the Turkmen themselves adopting the uh, peace method, uh, peaceful method, methods to achieve their rights. Thank you. Thank you. And it's time for one last question. Uh, let's go to uh, Faisal over here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm Faisal Istarabadi. Uh, uh, either for Jade or for Gareth, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, Erbil's relations with uh, Ankara improving. Uh, 
So I wonder if you could talk about the, uh, uh, you know, comment on Erbil's relations actually with the Arab states. My impression is that uh, uh, Erbil's relations with uh, Hamman, with uh, Riyadh, with Abu Dhabi and other Gulf states is, uh, uh, is uh, outstanding and in some cases better than that of Baghdad. So I wonder if you could comment on that in light of, the, of the, uh, your saying that at some point Kurdish independence becomes viable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think in terms of Iraq playing a more constructive uh, role in the region, certainly the areas where we seem to have found that there is more of a consensus and more of a conception of national interest seem to be uh, areas that are more below the radar. Um, the Iraq clearly does have enormous potential to act as a donor. I believe it's also provided some aid to, to Jordan. Again, not something that's very high profile, but something where there seems to be a consensus on the need to, to build that uh, relationship. Uh, I think there has certainly been pride expressed by a number of different Iraqi factions around Iraq hosting the Arab summit, although, again, to some degree that was soured uh, by a sense that Iraq has continued to be quite isolated from most of the Gulf countries. Uh, I think the relationship with Kuwait merits particular examination because clearly the, the Gulf countries don't have a single policy towards Iraq or a single relationship with Iraq. And the relations with Saudi and more recently with Qatar have been particularly strained. Um, but with UAE, there's been more trade cooperation. And with Kuwait, where you would assume there was the greatest potential uh, for a very uneasy relationship, Yes, there's still distrust, but there has been significant progress made in resolving some of the claims dating back from the war. And we've seen uh, just last month the resumption of direct flights once again uh, between Kuwait and Baghdad, which is a small marker of, of progress. Uh, I've also heard Iraqi politicians argue that there is much that they can share in terms of their constitution making experience and some of the limits thereof. Uh, with other Arab countries that are embarking on, on similar processes now. Um, but still, there's a great feeling of being isolated, of, of having been uh, undermined to some extent by other countries that, don't, that, that precisely don't want them to, uh, to be a successful case study. Uh, and I think those, those perceptions of continuing victimhood remain a, a major constraint. Um, I'll have to be quick, I think. We time. are. Um, I, I, I don't think I would ever dare disagree with Dr. Latif on, on, on anything, but I, and I'm not going to disagree with you today, but I don't, I don't think that... I, I agree with you about the overall Kurdish position is a pragmatic one, whereby okay, Kurdistan may be landlocked, it may have mountains, I don't think it's got nice chocolate, and, that, and it's not going to be like Switzerland you know, if it gets its independence. And so it's much better to be within a larger state a state that is democratic, pluralistic, etc., rather than strive out to try and have some form of independence and still be dependent upon Turkey as a big brother, perhaps going forward. But it is—it's. It, I think the phrase that we came up across from time and time again was that it's—it's it's not necessarily going to be the, something that's in the Kurds' control. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it seems to be Prime Minister Maliki that is being the divisive figure right now, and uh, I, I know we perhaps have disagreements on that, but the. The feeling is, is that if the, if the Kurds are going to go, then it would be one of being pushed rather than jumping. Um, we could talk about it after. I've got to run on to these other. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I, I agree with Jane about the, the contribution that Iraqis could make, but I think they have to resolve so many internal problems before they can start to, to show the world and, and other maybe post-Arab Spring states, the, the, the successful road of transition. Uh, there are certainly a lot of lessons to be learned. I'm not sure that they've been fully learned or, mm. or taken on board yet, but um, surely the, the, there is a lot of experience in all sorts of things in Iraq, and not just in insurgency uh, uh, and, and instability. Um, regarding the Turkmen, I, I, I do feel for our Turkmen friends here today that uh, as a, uh, in, in your position in Iraq, um, your voice has been marginalized, and I think it's clear why that is the case. Um, the, the numbers are simply, uh, I know the Turkmen statement of population numbers are considerably higher to what academics use, but still um, it, it is a, 
uh, as a smaller minority than others, but it's also a fact about the population distribution as well, in that the, the Kurds have a, a strong focused population in the three northern governorates. The Turkmen are, are very, very um, dispersed, and urban-based, dispersed, and have always struggled to mobilize themselves in a way, certainly in recent years, in the way that their counterparts in Iraq have done so successfully. Uh, I don't think it's the fact that Turkey is the Turkmen's big brother. I don't think Turkey is the Turkmen's big brother anymore. I think there's a, a, a watchful eye over Turkmen affairs, but I think that's about as far as it goes. My sense is that Turkish, Turkish support for the Turkmen community in Iraq in a meaningful way started to, to, to decline in 2006, seven onwards. Um, so I think um, it's much more a case for the Turkmen's of trying to find an accommodation with either Baghdad or Erbil or both going forward. But the notion of the Turkmen Ali or, or the, 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 Turkish, the Turkmen entity in the disputed territories, I, uh, unfortunately for Turkmen, I don't think we'll get very far. Um, and then finally, yes, uh, 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 Ambassador Pfizer brought up the Arab states. And until a few years ago, the UAE was the largest uh, financial uh, and in, uh, the, the largest investor in the Kurdistan region. It wasn't Turkey at all. And it was at to, to quite a significant level. And we've seen, certainly with the Gulf states and their deal, some very significant relationships develop. But Turkey is now the, 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 the big player on the block. It's moved from being engaged on the, as a contractor in the Kurdistan region to being an investor. And Turkish trade with the Kurdistan region is larger than the combined trade with Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, as Syria was. So this is a very, very significant economic relationship for Turkey. It's not just about the securitization of the Kurdish issue, about PKK, uh, about the competition with Iran and the old Ottoman and Qajar type, type games that are going on. It was a very real economic game, uh, a gain to be had both by Ankara and Erbil in that relationship, which perhaps is a tie that binds in, in deeper ways than, than some of the other dynamics that we talk about. I'd just like to finish, though. We've spent a lot of time talking about Kurdistan, which is understandable. Um, but our project is looking at the entirety of Iraq. And I think from the, talking about this in London at this point uh, is actually very interesting. We, we saw recently uh, the Christmas lecture of, of the Chief of Defense Staff, uh, mm -hmm. Sir Dave Richards, basically talking about a, some, articulating a, a return east of Suez, if we can say that, where we will see the British engage more and more, perhaps in the Gulf, in the UAE, in Oman, in Saudi Arabia, even in Jordan. And the politics of Iraq, even though I think our friends in the Foreign Office are keeping the politics of Iraq at arm's length right now, the politics of Iraq uh, and the future of Iraq and the foreign policies of Iraq in the Gulf could become far more important for British national interests mm. going forward. Thank you. We'll need to leave this there for now. We have coffee upstairs. Please come back uh, in 25 minutes for our, our keynote.